La ilahe illallah Muhammed Resulullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yevmidin. İyyâke na'budu ve iyyâke nestayin. Edine sıratıl mustakîn. Sıratıl lezîne anamta aleyhim. Gayril mağdubi aleyhim ve lazdalîn. Subhane Rabbike Rabbi Ezzeti ma yasifûn. Vesselamun Aleyküm Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Selamun Aleyküm So I, I want to also um, continue uh, with a few with another story but uh, before I tell that story I want to talk about another story and that is that if you are in that state of witnessing perfection, so you see now that you, you well, you, let's say you've, you're improving your salat. So you're developing through your salat a, a, a greater consciousness of the presence of Allah in your life, that that you are recognizing more and more as you improve the state of your salat, that state, that station is heading towards what is referred to as fi salatihim da'imun, that you're in a state of prayer at all times. You know, there. this is this a very uh, special condition a very possible condition for every human being because again coming back to the the understanding that each one of us has that light the presence of Allah the the spark of the nur azal within you that you can over time when you dis, dis, dis, dis, have a dissolving of the self in a consistent way that voke, that tasting of that reality within you becomes more present in your life. So this then becomes part of <laughs> that from what we give you, Allah orders us or, or explains a formula to us in Surah Al-Baqarah that from what we give you, you give out. So you become a conduit. This is a description of the potential for a human being that Whatever it is that you gain in terms of your understanding and knowledge and that you have now uh, uh, submitted more to that light and reality within you, it becomes part of the, your daily dynamic of life. So I want to just give you a, a short little story of how this can be very uh, amazing and uh, extraordinary and transformative in your life and with sharing with other people because Allah is sharing the whole uh, uh, creation with you individually and with all of humanity that that you are we are designed to echo the the ever generous the the the fuddle of Allah is is potentially there within you to over to pour over and to benefit your family and your, and your other people that you meet that is part of the description of a Muslim is that they're also giving out, they're sharing, they're giving, they're, you know, you, uh, you're, there's a hadith that says that you're not Muslim unless you want for your brother, your sister, what you want for yourself. Meaning is you recognize that the true reality of what you are designed for is present within everyone else as well. You're no different than anyone else. The only difference between anyone is their, their iman, their level of inner life, their inner uh, uh, uh, submission. And that is not something you, you talk about, you say anything, you don't. You, it, is within, it is kept within you, it's within your own heart. You, because you are always uh, loyal to that and you're always pr holding that precious in your life so that it becomes an act of humility and not an act of, of arrogance or haughtiness. So I want to just share this one little uh, anecdotal story. Um, I was um, in a very upmarket supermarket, 
and I was staring at a, uh, a counter that had the most amazing chocolates that I'd ever seen, right? And I really like chocolate, especially dark chocolate. And I was looking at these chocolates. They were all handmade and designed. And I had just come from South Africa. And I was, this was some years back, and I was helping Chef Fadlala edit the book, uh, Witnessing Perfection. And I was sort of in that mode of thinking of how everything is so perfect and uh, everything is connected. And, and if I don't see it, it's a fault in me, not in the reality. So I was sitting there looking at this chocolate, and this man comes up from behind me. And he just, <laughs> out of nowhere, he, just, he, he looks at me and says, witnessing perfection, right? Just like that. <laughs> and I'm going, what's happening here? You know, I mean, I, I got, all of a sudden I was thrilled, you know, that, that, and I said to him, I said, yeah, I said, look at this incredible universe. I mean, just, I don't, a stranger, I haven't I never met him before. I turned to him, I said, I said, look at this incredible universe that we live in. And then he looks at me and says, yeah, he says, I've been thinking about that. Anyway, within a few minutes, I said, let's have some coffee. And we sat down and, and uh, we started talking. And he told me how he held a very negative view of religion. And in particular, how he held a very negative you know, view of Islam. Uh, most of what he understood of Islam came from uh, you know, the, the media and so on. And, and so he had, I cleared up, uh, in our conversation, we were able to clear up some of these issues that were outstanding to him. And, and he said, you know, he said, for the first time in my life, he said, I really would think that I would consider being Muslim. He said, because of the way you're talking, I've never heard anything like that before. In fact, most Muslims haven't heard this as well, but that's a different story. But um, he just said, look, let's meet again and let's talk about uh, what it requires to be a Muslim and so on. And at the end of that, I just said to him, you know, like, what is it? That, that inspired you to come up to me and say witnessing perfection? He said, oh, he said, it's the chocolate, right? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, I made those chocolates. He was the manufacturer. <laughs> and he, so he was, he was referring to the chocolate. That they were perfectly, you know, that I, and he saw me witnessing them and he thought I was with, he took credit for the witnessing perfection. So I tell you, you, don't, you never know what sort of could lead you into something else. Here I, but here, this is the story, though. The story is, is that if you're in a good state, good meaning you are, you are not identified with all the issues and, and uh, things in your life that are troubling you, you are seeing yad Allah, the hand of Allah in your everyday life, you, you are referring to your heart as, and intuition as much as you can, you are improving your salat. You do. This is creating a, a, a state of beingness. And be really conscious of this, that when your state of beingness is, can resonate with other people, whether they're conscious of it or not. Because remember, we are nafs and wahideh. We're created from oneself. So our ru is connected to the ru of other people. The light which is within you, and you're becoming more conscious and aware of that light and raising your consciousness, it has an effect. And you can't calculate that effect. You can't claim that effect either. You have to be very careful with that one. There's, this is spiritual materialism, spiritual ambition. You know, I, I'm like what our brother was talking earlier yesterday about the idea of, you know, I'm a Sufi or I'm this or I'm that. Anything we, it starts with I am this and what I am that. You know, it, it, in it, it has the danger of becoming another layer of identification, of illusion of, of yourself, a trap. You know, it becomes like this. So you have to be very aware. The nafs is very tricky because the, the, the foundation of self, of the nafs, is based on survival. It is, you can take it all the way back, and we can talk about this in detail another time, to the, to the, the permeable cell that was initiated by the energy and the material of the universe, and its main re uh, uh, drive was to survive. That beginning of the permeable cell, as it, mo as it complexified through evolution and became the human being, is, key, is, is foundational in our whole structure, psychologically, and the development of the sociology and the, 
uh, in the, the, how we live and who we are, very much survival. So the nafs reflects that. It wants to survive. I, I, you know, I am so and so. I, you know, I, I am this person or I am that person. I have this car. I have this business or it, it, whatever it is. It, it, it is about surviving. So it wants to, you know, m maintain that. But if you then look at that and witness it and see this, th that it, its foundation is completely illusory, that it, you have, there is no such thing as you. You are predicated on a, a desire and a decree of Allah to, to, that Allah be known and be worshipped. That is your, your entire mission in existence. Anything else to that is secondary but useful also for that secondary, for that primary purpose. But if you're identified with that, then you are you are like blocking your uh, and veiling and blocking your your the, that light that is within you. If you are focusing on that light within you and you are developing the the taste of that, so you entering into that mirab more and more, then you will naturally v resonate with others, and that's why Allah says His Allah says His rahma is with His jama, right. There's an X factor. When people pray together, there's an X factor of expansion of heart. When people are like this in this gathering, they say that people who leave their home and they travel for the dhikr of Allah, for the remembrance of Allah, for the gathering of that dhikr, that 70,000 angels follow them. And then when, if you take that 70 and you multiply it by 50 people and you get another, you get, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions, but it's not about money. It's not about this countability. It's not about the number. It means that it's it's it's just a, a, a, a exponential, seventy and forty. And there are many numbers that appear in our cosmology of Islam that have that are important. But in this case, it it it more refers to something which is beyond calculation. Seventy thousand, one hundred thousand, million. That there's this X factor that multiplies when you make the intention and come together with others for the remembrance of Allah. It benefits you and it benefits other people. We're all connected in, in, this, uh, in this way. So the idea here is to be in the best of states so that the best of outcomes can come to your life. If you are always identified with self, then you're going to trip. Uh, Allah wants you to realize that that's an illusion, so you will find difficulty. You will find things that will happen to you that you will have to question and you will have to experience. But if you're resonant more with that light within you, then you can, when these things do come to you and happen to you, you glean and you take from them the lesson that needs to be learned. You hear Allah's speaking to you through your experience in life. You read your life, ikra. This is the first thing that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He it was the first word of revelation. Ikra, read, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Read what?" He said, he, "You know." He said, "Read." He said, "I have created you from this little magla." I don't know the Arabic word, but it means just a little lump of flesh. But you know, but when they asked the Prophet and they asked Imam Ali about this lump of flesh, he said. He said, know that, you're, that this lump of flesh in it has the whole universe contained within it. So this is who you are. You have the whole universal narrative, the whole universal reality of, of Allah's plot and plan within you, and your life is an is a, a expression to adhere, acknowledge, recognize, imbibe, and realize that that is your true nature. So I want to uh, share a, a, another story um, and with you regarding, again, this idea of decree and destiny and how things happen in a way that you could not uh, plan or organize, but it happens in, in any case. So I'll, I'll tell you a story about, uh, I was in um, Pakistan. I was there with a uh, Sheikh Fadlullah asked me to spend 10 days out of every month with a, a Chishti 
Sheikh, Sheikh Sayyid uh, Ikram Hussein. Some of you know who he is. Uh, he's passed away, I think, about six or seven years ago, rahmatullah alayhi. And he, had, he was an amazing being. He was a hakim, and he spent most of his life, uh, never took any, uh, being a hakim, and he had thousands of murids all over India and in Pakistan. And he, he was praying every day before uh, I had come to Pakistan, before Sheikh Fadlallah even had came, come to Pakistan. He was praying every day that Allah would send him someone from the, the, the field of Karbala, he was talking, you know, that someone from that ilk would come and be a, uh, a help to him in his work. And when we arrived in Pakistan and he spoke to us, he eventually met Sheikh Fadlallah and he realized that Sheikh Fadlallah was the, the, actually the person that he was praying for. And there are many things that happened, and I uh, can go into that a little bit later, but, the, but Sheikh Fadlallah, after a while, asked me to spend 10 days uh, a month with him uh, every, every month. So I did. For one year, I spent 10 days. He actually came to my home, or, or I would go to where he was staying in Karachi, and I would stay uh, with him for 10 days at a time. Um, anyway, I was there at that time with uh, my former wife, who has passed away, rahmatullah alayhi. And at that time, she was not well. She was having a hormonal imbalance, and she was uh, bleeding a lot. And Sheikh Ikram was, had come to our house and he said that he knows the exact cure for this. He said, you need, and he said, you need to go to the bazaar. And, and the bazaar was in a place called uh, Karada, which is a, a, a, uh, a, a it's a, biz I've said this so many times before, but it's a bizarre bazaar. You know, it's a, it, it is a place uh, where, uh, Behind the, the mosque of Karada, there are dawakhanas, places where you can buy medicine and things like that. But there are also so many other black market things that are back there. And it's only a place where certain people go. You know, you have to be very careful. And I, I knew that about the place. So when he told me that I had to go there, I was a, a very apprehensive, especially when he said, what you need to go there for is six grams of berberis, and six grams of afyun, which is opium, right? Now, here's the problem. You know, I'm, you know, an American, you know, guy, easily stands out in the crowd in Pakistan, and I'm looking for six grams of opium, right? And, uh, you know, that is a scary thought for me. And I didn't want to wind up in a Pakistani jail, uh, which was, could have been easily done. And I said to Sheikh Ikram, I said, you know, I'm concerned to go to the, to go out and look for opium. And he said, Maf, don't worry, you can, you'll go, just, just go, right? So I trusted him. So I went to Karada and I started going to the different dawakhanas looking for uh, opium. Of course, the response from most of the people at the dawakhanas were, they chased me out with a broomstick. You know, they told me they were going to call the police on me. Uh, at one point, I became very agitated. I went to about three or four different dawakhanas, and I had the same, you know, response from them all. Um, even though I tried to explain that it was my, the Sufi <coughs> sheikh had told me, and of course, they, they just looked at me like I was mad. And so I, I started giving up. You know, and it became late, and a certain type of people started coming to Qatar in this bazaar that were concerning me also. So I decided that I was, I was going to leave. So on my way out, all of a sudden, as I'm walking out through one of the gates of this bazaar, I feel a tug on my sleeve. And that was very common, you know, because the children who are all there begging for money, they, they come and they pull you, you know, and they ask for... Uh, money and, and you know and I thought it at first I thought it was it so I pulled my arm away and then when I looked it was what I saw was there was this man wearing a chisti cap beautiful white beard and a, a, a nice vest 
sitting on the ground in the middle of this bazaar, you know, just like a perfectly clean and beautiful, uh, something extraordinary. I mean, I, you just would not, compared to the rest of the scene around it, it was, it was visionary. So he looked at me and he said, you know, Beto, you know, sit down. So I sat down with him on this blanket that he had, and he said to me, uh, what are you doing here? Right? And I started to explain to him. I said, well, I said um, that today my sheikh told me to come here and I'm looking for six grams of uh, berberis and six grams of opium. And when I said that to him, tears came to his eyes. And he said, I need to tell you something. Right? I said, okay. He said, last night... Now, this is the night before the sheikh had told me to come there. Last night, he said, I had a dream of my sheikh. He came to me. He said, I want you to go to this bazaar and sit there and wait until you see a very unusual person and greet him for me. <laughs> he said, that's you. He pointed at me, right? He said, it's you, right? And... I couldn't help it. I became overwhelmed, and I also I cried with him. He and then he and then he had he, he turned out to be a hakim, a healer, and he had a little black bag with him, and he brought it in front of him, and he opened it up, and the first thing he pulled out was those little brass scales that they have with little weights, and he held it, and he was shuffling through his bag, and he pulled out berberis, which he had in his bag, and then right after that he pulled out a little disc in a plastic bag. I recognized it immediately. And it was black tar opium. And he put it on the scale and he put the, uh, the weights on. It was exactly six grams of opium and six grams of berberis. And we were both completely you know, awestruck by that moment. And he gave it to me. And he said, this is for you and this is why I came here. And we stood up together, and I hugged him, and I said, can we see each other again? And, and then I stupidly, you know, reached in my pocket to try to give him some money. You know, because I, it, you kind of get used to that in Pakistan. Everybody kind of wants your money there. Uh, not everyone, please excuse me, but it's common. And I started to give him some money, and he just said no. He said, I don't want anything from you. He said, this is, you know... I came here on the order of my sheikh, and he gave me the, the opium, and then he literally just walked away from me, and that was it. We never saw each other again. So I took that opium uh, home, and I, gr I grinded the, the opium with the, uh, the berberis, and Sheikh Ikram had told me to make six tablets out of it and give, uh, uh, um, so sorry, make a bunch of tablets and give her six tablets every three hours so that the blood would stop. So he said, make them the size of garbanzo beans, you know, chickpeas. So they were, you know, about, what I guess, about a half a quarter centimeter or something like that, maybe a little bit bigger. And I gave them to her, and the, it did work. It, it stopped her bleeding, uh, but it also made her high as a kite, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't think that that was probably what the sheikh had thought was going to happen. And... Uh, but she was very happy, and the, you know the, the the bleeding stopped. And then the sheikh came to my house, and he he looked at her, and he looked at me. And he said, "Let me see." You know, Deco, he wanted me to show him the pills. So I poured the pills that I made in his hand, and he looked at them, and then he looked at me, and he said, "Too big, right?" <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't understand was that the and he actually cut each one into fours, right? <laughs> But in my mind, a chickpea, American-style chickpea, <laughs> genetically probably modified, is this big thing, you know? But in fact, in Pakistan, a dried chickpea is just a tiny little thing. So I kind of messed up there. But it did the job in any case. But alhamdulillah, it was, you know, you think about something like that. And like, how is it that... Uh, that this man, the night before, had a vision of his sheikh telling him to be there, to ostensibly to meet me, 
And on the next day, I was told by our sheikh to be there at that moment. So how does that overlapping of time and space coordinate like that? See, this is something which is, you know, uh, amazing. If you think about it, uh, it implies that everything is already in motion. In time, is already in motion reflecting the optimum now, the optimum moment. So that and everything that happens, this is what I glean from this experience, everything that happens to you in this very moment is optimal for you at this very moment, regardless of what has come before or what will is coming to you. It, everything is coordinated for the now. For the moment, so you can in your, so you can in your in, in your ability to image into your chayal. You have this. You have an inner sense called chayal. It's called the imaginal self, which I would recommend that everyone read uh, the section in Journey of the Self about the five outer senses and the five inner senses. There are, and I, I won't go into it now, but. It's very important to give you an understanding of that you have in you a inner sensory uh, cosmology which stores and it responds and is as dynamically active as and contributes to your perception of the world that you live in. And just briefly, the, what they are is hissa mushtarik, which is the combining self, which takes all your outer senses and combines it into a singular experience. And, in, and the next to that is called the chayal, which is that which is you're able to, to create from those sensory experiences and the combination of your sensory experiences a, a plausible uh, experience of the outer. So my experience of Yusuf sitting here is all happening within me. Just like each one of you who are sitting here today what you're hearing and what you're seeing and what you're experiencing inwardly in your in your consciousness is happening within you. This is there's no outside. The outside is a very limited range and spectrum of of light and movement and energy. But the way you experience all of this is happening within you. Simply example is the light that comes into your eye reflects on your retina. It's actually upside down. Your brain turns it right side up. It's an electrical charge that goes into your, your synapse nerves. They're all firing off and calling upon your memory and your experience to create what you're seeing in front of you. So all of this is in part happening within you. This is an important thing to grasp and to keep in mind as you go on in life, that everything is happening within you. So the chayal is that, uh, that and then the, the, the next part is called the wahima, which is the, the which gives meaning. It comes from uh, uh, um, um, wahima. What's the, uh, I know I forgot the root, but it means to, to, uh, uh, uh, mean, to give meaning to that experience. And that, so that when you see something, for instance, you know he's a friend, they're an enemy, he did something bad to me and immediately you know, I, uh, I give them that attribute. And all that is stored in what's called the hafidha, which is your memory, your collective memory. And behind that, which is the most uh, uh, important for us, is the mufakkara, which is the reflective self, the re that can look out in a non-judgmental and a, just a witnessing fashion of how you experience the world and how the memories and the meaning and the form that you're giving to the world is all part of a filter, a filtering system that is designed for you to experience the world. You know, we, we experience the world through these facilities within us. It's important to have this understanding because once you, know, you see that, you can begin to uh, understand why you react to some things and why the other, like you may see someone who maybe uh, evokes a hurt within you. Well, instead of being identified with that hurt, you then look at it and say, well, that hurt has been stored in my memory and I've given it a meaning and I've given it this form of this person. So you can 
when you are approach it from the mafakara, from the reflective aspect of yourself, from the rakib within you, the witnesser, then you're not so inclined at that to be totally identified with that hurt and the hurtful person, but rather you make a space to be, have compassion and love and forgiveness happen from the heart. So this is a an int- a, dy- a dynamic which is important to understand, and there's a, a good chapter on this in uh, Journey of the Self, and it's a very good thing to to like to understand and to work with in your in your daily life. Um, I think that's it for now. One minute is it? Alhamdulillah. Does anybody have any um, reflections or questions or they want to bring up? something that we, you've heard now said that you want clarified in some way or um, that you want unpacked a little bit more, focused on a little bit more that's touched you in particular. If you have, you can do it here now for, and other people would benefit. If not, um, I'm, if you see me anytime, I'd be very happy to sit with anybody and look at this particular or any particular aspect of what we discussed together. Um, in more deeply and more in, in, in un, in unpacking it uh, in a different way. You were, before you started talking about the inner senses, you were specifically talking about the khayat <coughs> in relation to um, uh, this, you know, the, the, <coughs> the now, experiencing the now. What were you... What, was what I was meaning there was that the, the khayal is... And is a uh, facet of perception, of ability to perceive in a, and create uh, uh, the illusion of solidity to a thing. Uh, it also has infinite possibilities. So that's why it's important to, uh, I know what you're getting at, it's important to um, practice, like, ch- I'll give you an idea, children. Children see fairies, right? And they see uh, little gnomes and and they, they see, they have little friends sometimes, you know, that they imagine. Or, or when they're out there playing, they're talking to things. And, and it's because their Im- imaginable, their imagine, their khayal is free. It's not yet, you know, bound by convention and experience of life and so on. They're, it's, it's less uh, encumbered, so they have this ability. And then we tell them, no, the world is like this, and it's not like that. And, then, then, and you know, and we try to you know, corner them and to contextualize it. That's okay. That, that's, you know, but there's also a hindrance in that too. Because the chayal, if you didn't have your chayal, you couldn't right now, you couldn't right now blast off in your, in your mind and go off into another galaxy and see the galaxy from above it, see all the, the solar systems that are spinning around and and, and, and you couldn't go now dive into your hand and see the atomic, the molecular and the atomic structure in your mind right now of the, of the atoms looking like the galaxies. And, and that between them is, is also space. And the, the chayal is an important uh, facet of your consciousness to expand your consciousness so that you can... The, it also has an infinite, infinite possibilities. Like if I said to you right now, imagine a, a horse with the head of a dog. You can do that in an instant because that chayal, that ability to image is, is God-given for you to be able to uh, see the universe and see how it's all connected. Make the connections through your imaginal. See yourself as being a, a mirror of, of, of atoms, of galaxies, of, of the universal beingness. You need these, this chayal to be expanded. If you don't have that, the chayal expanded and operating within you, then you think it's all just this world. It's just, it's just what I see, feel, and touch, and when I die, it's all uh, gone into oblivion, into chaos, and nothing is coordinated, and nothing is patterned and the chayal makes you see patterns makes you see the universal interconnectedness think of like in a, what the muslims through the centuries 
have done when they created these beautiful domes and geometric structures. That didn't just come out of nowhere. That came out of an understanding that, we're, that all things are connected. If you ever look at a dome and you see, you know, you see stars and uh, triangles and circles and all these myriad of, of archetypal um, symbolic uh, uh, uh, geometric figures, but if you break them down, they're all lines actually, right? Mm -hmm. that, that intersect with each other. So it's about connection. It's about line of, it's about what you see, what you experience. You're making that geometric connection with your world and the universe. That's what that means. It's a mirror of the dynamic of the human consciousness. All, that's why we love it. That's why we love mandala. Think of it, look at the carpets that we're sitting on. Every one of them has pretty much a mandala. This is a Qibla, but the center of most carpet in, ge in geometry is mandala. That's why we look at a flower, a lotus flower. It's a mandala. Everything is a mandala. We're all mandalas. You're a mandala. You're a mandala. Think of it. You have, you have the core within you, which is the rub al amri rabbi, and then you have this whole cosmology within you of the petals of that flower, you know, of the, uh, of the chayal and the, mem and the, the, the, the memory, the, all the attributes that, are, that grow into, extend out into your hands and into your being. We're all like that. We're all part of, and then we're all part of a greater mandala, etc., etc., etc., etc. Okay? All right. Anything else? From... All right, I have to tell you one more story. It just, again, they just, he just came to me about the interconnectedness of things. I told this story in South Africa, so Sheikh Muslim knows it, and Abdus Salam, a few others. Yeah, but I'll see. So, again, interconnectedness, decree and destiny. We're all living Allah's decree, and we're all harmonizing with Allah's decree, creating that which creates our destiny. Um, when I was I was living in England that year that I went, I was, got on that first class flight, and I was attending a, uh, a big urs in Manchester, England. There was a, an urs for a Naqshbandi uh, sheikh, and we all went up there, and it was fabulous. It was thousands of people, and they were cooking food in these big like, pots that they stirred it with a, with a boat oar. I don't know if you, <laughs> have you ever seen those? They have them in Pakistan at the at the Darba, you know, like Bab, at uh, Baba Farid and Pakpatan and uh, in Lahore they have it at Data Sab. They have these unending, like gigantic pots. You literally you have to walk up to, to the edge of the pot on a on a ladder, like five or six steps, and you look in and it's just and people throw meat and vegetables and it's on a big fire. It's it's it's wild, and they they they want it in um, in Lahore has been going for like 40 years. They haven't cleaned it even. They've just, you know, <laughs> when I learned that, it was a little hard eating the, re the rest of my lunch there. But it, it just, it's an ongoing feast of food. Anyway, um, this was only going for a couple of hours, uh, alhamdulillah. And uh, there was about a few thousand people there, and they were all doing dhikr and celebrating the urs of, the, uh, of their sheikh. And I was sitting in a big circle at one point. Uh, and the circle was so big that the, the guy d directly in front of me was about this big, right? Uh, like an inch big um, uh, to my vision. But I could see him because he had a beautiful face. There was something shining and lovely about his face and his beard and his chisty cap. And he just looked really magnificent. And so every so once in a while uh, uh, during the dhikr, I would look up at him and then I'd see him like this with his hands, like this over his face. And then every so once in a while, he would go like this and look at me, right? <laughs> you know, like that. And, I, and, and, and so I felt, oh, after the dhikr, I'm going to go greet him because I felt a heart connection of somehow with him. So the dhikr went on and after the dhikr, it dispersed and I went to try to find him, right? But I couldn't find him anywhere. 
because there's thousands of people, I, was, I just couldn't find him. So I want you to keep that in mind for one moment. Six months later, I'm in the mosque in Norwich in, in, uh, in England. I was actually living in the mosque there uh, toward the end of my stay in, in, uh, in Norwich with the community of people there. And I really wanted to leave because I, I had really taken what I could, I felt at that time, from the community there. And I just didn't, wasn't resonating anymore with what I felt was going on there. So I wanted to go. So I made dua that I would leave this place. And I prayed that I had no money and I had no one to give me any money. And so I just prayed that I would leave. One day after Juma. relative world of time and space, only to then meet and realize and experience the one and only at the end of this very short journey of life. So it, it behooves us all in this message, in this story, to prepare for that moment so that when you leave this world, you leave it with a of being like a bride or, or a groom, you know, that rather than a, somebody scraping to have another minute left, you know, how poor that would be for us if we, at that moment of our last, that we're scraping for another breath rather than waiting to meet our, our bride or our groom. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, shukrila. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Medin, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, Adina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen, Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim, Ghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim, Wal-Adhalin, Subhana Rabbika Rabbi Azzati Amayasifun, Wassalamu Ala Mursaleen, Alhamdulillahi